Hi, I'm Alan Jay. I'm the Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA. Welcome to our latest edition of Zoom with ZOA. We're honored to have very special guests. We have um, people who brought to us a documentary film called Whose Land, which makes the case for Israel's uh, right to sovereignty. I'm going to leave the rest of the introduction to our wonderful board chair, Mark Levinson, who is going to take over from this point. Mark has been with the DOA for several years under his leadership. We've enjoyed a lot of successes. Mark is a staunch advocate and Zionist. We're very lucky to have Mark with us. Um, and I'm just quickly going to turn the program over to Mark. I want everybody to understand that Q&A this afternoon will be under that feature only. Please keep yourselves on mute for the duration of the program. And uh, we're going to start this program with a 10 minute trailer of the film, but I'm going to give it over to Mark to introduce that. Good morning, everyone. Or uh, I guess as we're getting close to the afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you all for being here. It's going to be a great, great program today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists after we watch the trailer. Trailer. It's a terrific trailer. It's around 10 minutes. Jackie, can we get that queued up? And if we do that and share the screen, we're going to watch the trailer. And then after the trailer, we'll uh, get into the more formal part of the program. Hey, Hey, Ardal Miad, Homa Fakrubia, who didn't have me at Ilom. Like in here, Miad, let us me home, Lil Kada Ali home, be Amer Rabbilabet. Joseph Goebbels, who was Hitler's architect of the campaign to brand the Jewish people as a subhuman race in Nazi Germany, was quoted as saying, if a lie is repeated often enough, then the people will believe it. A similar tactic is being used today in the propaganda war waged against Israel by Islam and the pro-Palestinian factions in the Middle East. At the heart of the propaganda war against Israel is the use of fake history and lawfare, the revision and deliberate misrepresentation of international law. Whose Land is a documentary film looking at the legitimacy of Israel in international law with a highly qualified group of historians and international lawyers. San Remo, the Villa de Vacha. This is a place where legal rights were given to both the Jewish people and the Arab people. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. San Remo basically adopted the content of the Balfour Declaration and it was approved by 51 countries, which was then the international community. The international law that governs the settlements relies on the San Remo Conference. That is the basis. That's not been changed. The San Remo Resolution of 1920, its unanimous endorsement by the League of Nations, and the mandate document which incorporated the Balfour Declaration is binding under international law to this day. In formulating legally binding instruments, there was a recognition of the cultural historic roots of the Jewish people in that land. You see they are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. Which means that if they can establish that they had 
a vibrant community in, in Jerusalem, in Hebron, or in Shiloh, and in, in different areas of the Holy Land, they've been given the right to reconstitute these communities. Article 80 of the UN Charter assumes the powers that were given to the League of Nations so that anything that was decided under the League of Nations, such as the San Remo Resolution, such as the Mandate for Palestine, are still legally binding under the UN Charter. It becomes part of international law. At the same time, we will reveal that the Palestinian claim to any part of the land has no historical basis at all. Of course, there was no Palestinian nation. Salah Adin, neither Dar el Omar, had in mind building an Arab Palestinian nation as they write today in their history. Nobody had any thoughts of Palestinian nationalism at that time, whatever, um, because there was no such place as the state of Palestine, and never had been. And nobody had gone for generations thinking, I'm a Palestinian. So the name Palestine after 1948 was kind of adopted by the non-Jewish Palestinians. And they say, we are the true Palestinians. We belong in the land. We are the indigenous people. And these Jews came in later and created this colonial thing called Israel. The Palestinian Authority tells their people that the, the Jewish people did not have a history in the land of Israel. Uh, and this is one of their fundamental principles of their ideology. Uh, and therefore they claim that there never was a Jewish presence in Jerusalem. An UNESCO resolution that basically says that Jews and Israel do not have any connection to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount is something that should stay in history as the biggest, the biggest lie whose land does not set out to justify the right of Israel to exist. Instead, it simply tells the truth. The attempt of the modern Palestinians to say, oh, we go back to antiquity, there always were Palestinians here, is rubbish in historical terms. Media coverage of the Middle East and even United Nations resolutions use terminology such as occupied Palestinian territory and the illegal occupation. Is this terminology based on international law or is it simply anti-Israel propaganda? The term Palestinian territories or occupied Palestinian territories or OPT, which is used in virtually every General Assembly resolution in the UN, this expression has got absolutely no basis whatsoever. It's, it's, it's utter nonsense. The Arab rejection of Resolution 181 precludes uh, the Arabs from any legal claim they might otherwise have to that territory. Jordan, Syria, Egypt had n no claim to Jerusalem or the West Bank on the basis of any do doctrinal principle of international law. So the Jewish settlements and the claim for Israel to exercise jurisdiction uh, over the West Bank, I think is legally, legally supported, certainly by Article 80 of the UN Charter. Will the two-state solution really bring peace to the Middle East? The Palestinian Authority, through the frameworks that it controls, television, uh, Ministry of Education, goes out of its way. To, to tell its children that Israelis can never be, be peace partners um, because the problem is not land and the problem is not Israel. The problem is our essence as Jews. I don't think that there is an interest of the Palestinian leader to solve the conflict. سيكون في الجنة وكل جريح سيكتب له الله الثواب هذا الأقصى لنا 
والقيامة لنا كلها لنا لا يعني حق لهم أن يدنسوها أن يدنسوها بأقدامهم القذرة. I think that the Oslo can be considered as that tragedy for the Palestinian people. In my opinion, the Palestinian Authority or the Palestinian leadership are not acting since the Oslo Agreement until today as a leadership. What Israel has had to do is effectively just give, give, give. And uh, we've seen this for so long now that it seems to me uh, to be an obvious part of um, Palestinian diplomacy. Uh, they just take, take, take. A state need to be built before it's recognized. And unfortunately, I didn't see neither the Palestinian Authority nor the international community are trying to build a Palestinian state. The idea that you can make out of a state are two completely different entities which are hostile to one another, where the president of one of them um, hasn't actually been uh, elected, his term of office ended years ago, where the other one is an actual terrorist organisation, um, which is still firing rockets into its neighbour. That is not the kind of state that the United Nations should want uh, amongst its members. Join me, Richard Kemp, in the two-part documentary film, Whose Land?, as we uncover the true story behind the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, thank you, that was terrific. Uh, can we, uh, I, I guess we can leave that. Okay, good, good, terrific, thank you. Okay, just so everyone understands how we're gonna do the program, we have three terrific speakers. I will introduce each speaker and invite them to talk for five, six minutes. Then we'll do the bio and introduction of the next speaker. And when we finish all three speakers, we will go to Q and A. The goal is to try to uh, finish up by around one o'clock. And then I'll ask Alan Jay to give a close. Um, we will start with, and, and we will be doing the Q&A through the chat. I think everyone's following the chat. The questions should come through the chat and we'll, we'll raise your questions that way to our uh, distinguished group of speakers. Okay, first up, Hugh Kitson, the writer, producer, and director of Whose Land. Hugh has more than 45 years experience working in the film and television industry as a documentary filmmaker and he's been involved in more than 200 productions as an editor, director, writer, and or producer, and he's won over 20 international awards. His documentaries about Israel span more than four decades. Among the most notable ones are The Forsaken Promise, From Exile to Restoration, and Give Peace a Chance. Mr. Kitson, if you'd be kind enough to talk to us about your involvement here and whatever, whatever else you want in six minutes. Uh, unmute, please unmute you. Thank you. There we are. Yeah. yeah, there you are. Okay, first of all, why did we make Whose Land? Well, this, um, uh, this project's actually been on my mind for almost 30 years. And I began to, to notice, even before the Oslo process began or became public, that the Palestinians were trying to rewrite history. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I, I became um, interested in the legal side of it. I began to realize that uh, the modern state of Israel has a very valid legal foundation through the San Remo resolution uh, of 1920 and then the, the mandate for Palestine that was awarded to Britain. And very sadly, the waters have been muddied in so many respects. Uh, and it's basically because what Britain did was to violate the terms of the mandate. We violated our legal obligations um, under the mandate on almost every single level. And one of the effects of this has been that 
the uh, legal rights of the Jewish people to uh, Eretz Israel have been turned on their head, not in reality, but in, in, in perception. And so you have today the situation where uh, Israel's legal rights to uh, sovereignty in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria are actually being undermined. And what Britain was obligated to do under the mandate was to uh, help reconstruct or reconstitute uh, the Jewish national home, or at least help the Jewish people to do that. And, and so um, with all the lawfare, with BDS and everything, um, Israel's uh, right to live in peace in her own historical homeland is, is being undermined. And so this is the main reason for, for making this film. Now, you can, you can watch the first part of it on our website. Um, the first part looks at Israel's legal foundations and historic and legal foundations and takes us up to 1948 when David Ben-Gurion declared the independence of the State of Israel. Um, the, the second part, which looks at 1948 onwards, uh, we're, we're, we're still making that and we need to raise further funds to do it. But when we are able to complete it and release it, um, we'll do that. And I'm very privileged to have both Richard Kemp involved as our on-camera presenter, as you saw, um, and Andrew Tucker is, is also uh, involved as one of the seven lawyers that we, uh, that we interviewed. Um, for for the documentary, so I'll I'll leave it at that and and pick up uh, if if I got, get answered um, asked any questions in the Q and A. Thanks very much, Mark. And by the Thanks. way, thank you to to the Zionist Organization of America for putting this on. Well, thank you, Hugh. Just before we uh, move over to Andrew, uh, we we love this project. We love what you're doing. ZOA stands proudly and strongly uh, on these issues and the right of, of the 500,000 uh, Israeli citizens that live there to be in the land that is not only our biblical land, but Balfour, et cetera. And uh, so we're very pleased. We, we stand exactly with you on this and, and we thank you and everyone for, for this project, which is sorely needed for sure. Thank you. Okay, Andrew Tucker. Uh, Andrew Tucker is a lawyer, writer, and speaker. I especially like the lawyer part. Uh, Andrew studied law in Australia, uh, University of Melbourne in the UK. He worked for almost 20 years in Australia, UK, and the Netherlands as an advisor to private companies, governments, and public organizations in institutional and European law. Uh, from 2004 to 2018, Andrew was executive director of Christians for Israel International. He currently serves as editor-in-chief of the publication, Israel and Christians Today. He writes a weekly column and is international advisor to Christians for Israel International. Andrew is also the author of many publications, including uh, Israel on Trial, How International Law is Being Misused to Delegitimize the State of Israel. Andrew lives in the Netherlands with his wife, Mary Ann, and their four children, and we're delighted to have him be with us here today. Andrew. Can we unmute Andrew? How is that? Can you hear me? We hear you fine and you're looking terrific. So it's all. Oh, well, if you come a little bit closer, you'll realize that uh, things are not quite as good as they look. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's great to, uh, to be with you. I'm speaking to you from just outside The Hague in the Netherlands, which is the international legal capital of the world. And there are two cases going on here at the moment where the status of Jerusalem is the subject uh, potentially of a judicial decision, one in the International Criminal Court and the other in the International Court of Justice. So I think the topic is uh, super relevant at the moment. 
um, I think it's reaching a kind of a, a climax in a way we've seen after the last 40 or 50 years that this whole thing is, is coming to some kind of um, um, perhaps a climax. Uh, I don't know what those institutions are going to decide, but in all likelihood, uh, they won't be favorable for Israel. And that is because Israel is fighting basically a very lonely fight in the international community. Um, our organization Think, which I think is the only one in Europe really uh, looking at these issues about the status of Israel and the Jewish people under international law. I think it's terribly important that here within the um, international institution and certainly within the EU, which has completely lost its, uh, lost its path on all these issues, that we re-examine these issues. And our goal is really to do three things. We're analyzing how it could possibly be that the world, uh, including the EU, but the UN as well, uh, has got to the point where San Remo, for example, has been turned on its head. We're actively involved in some of these processes. We're making submissions to the International Criminal Court, for example. Um, and we're involved in education. We think it's very important to be educating the younger generation and the older one uh, of Christians and Jews particularly, who, so that they can be effective, um, effective witnesses and effective advocates on behalf of the Jewish people into the uh, national and international institutions. Um, just very briefly, I, I sort of see four kind of trends which I think have contributed to this strange uh, situation. One is, I mean, the, the history of, of the land and certainly of Judea and Samaria is very complex uh, with the way that Israel came into being in the midst of conflict. Uh, the mandate was unclear in the sense that, you know, it spoke about a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. But we know there was so much politics around that, about what is Palestine, what is a Jewish homeland, and then the series of wars between 1947 and 1967, then through to 1973. But I think the history is complex. The law, the law is complex. Um, Secondly, you know, Israel took a very strategic decision in 1967, that is to incorporate Jerusalem into the state of Israel after the Six Day War, but not the rest of the so-called West Bank. And I think in a way, uh, put itself into a very difficult, difficult position by entering into a discourse about occupation. You know, the legal advisors within the State of Israel at the time said we need to treat this as occupied territory, even though we don't believe it's legally occupied, we must treat it de facto as occupied. And so I think this created a lot of confusion. If Israel had simply incorporated the territories, life would be a lot different. I understand the reasons for not doing that, by the way. The third point, I think, is that international law itself has changed enormously since especially 1945 and you know many international lawyers they're not terribly interested in San Remo uh, anymore or the mandate because their whole mindset is about human rights and international humanitarian law and the rights of civilians and the rights of individuals so in a way I think we're having a discourse uh, there's a breakdown of paradigms. And one of our big challenges is to explain to people that what happened before 1967 is relevant. It still does have meaning and that the world is not just about human rights. It's also about the history and the rights of the Jewish people and the legal events that Hughes and, and, um, and, and, the film talk about prior to 1967, but it's 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 rather an uphill uh, battle because the whole language and the culture of international law has has changed so much. So I, I think it's a, it's it's a difficult fight that we're in, but I see a lot of um, light at the end of the tunnel. I see a number of countries 
uh, including my own homeland, Australia, who uh, are gradually coming on board and starting to speak out favorably um, about these historical issues and supporting the state of Israel. And, and there are a number even of European states that are, that are doing this, like Austria, for example, and Hungary, some of the Baltic states, Eastern European states. So that, that's just by way of introduction, but I, I think it's a long battle. I think we've got a long way to go, but um, we're, we're fighting on the right side. Terrific, thank you, Andrew. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce Colonel Richard Kemp, CBE, who is a retired British Army officer. Colonel Kemp was attached to the cabinet office between 2001 and 2006, serving as chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee advising the National Crisis Management Group known as COBRA. In 2003 to 2004, he was commander of the British forces in Afghanistan. He has also given evidence before United Nations fact-finding mission on the Gaza conflict. He has given numerous interviews for the BBC and other media organizations on security and intelligence matters. I've had the personal pleasure and privilege of spending a lot of time with Richard before a number of presentations in, in Israel and in Washington and elsewhere. He's, uh, he's an incredible uh, individual in his own right, but he's been a real gift to the Jewish people in terms of his outspoken support of the IDF as being the most moral uh, army in probably the history of the world. When few people are willing to stand up publicly as they should for the IDF, Colonel Kemp has been there for us and, and, and that certainly uh, presents him in, in, in a light that is terrific for our organization and our uh, audience. And so it's my personal privilege and pleasure to uh, introduce Colonel Kemp uh, to have his five or six minutes here before we get on to Q&A. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mark, um, for those extremely kind remarks. I, um, I've, I've, spent, I've spent a lot of time in recent years working alongside pro-Israel groups in the United States, in Europe and elsewhere. And, and I don't think I've worked along uh, with any group that is so strong and staunch and unwavering in its support for the state of Israel as what I call the ZOA, but I believe you over there call the ZOA. But it's a, it's a, pr pr a pleasure and a privilege to be joining you and your, uh, your associates tonight. Um, or tonight in England. I'm speaking from England. Um, and uh, England, England has been involved in, um, in Israel, Palestine for many years, as we've heard just, just now. Um, and it really began in earnest. So obviously, you know, Britain's history with the, biblical, with the Holy Land goes back many years, but it began in earnest really in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, in which Britain didn't just make that declaration alone, but Britain rallied the support of, um, of the international community effectively to provide support for a, a Jewish national homeland in the land of Palestine. And that in due course, of course, became the mandate that Britain was given by the League of Nations to do so. Some other major event occurred at the same time in 1917 as well, which is, uh, is often not forgotten about, but people don't really ne necessarily recognize the importance of it, which was the, the Palestine campaign conducted by General Allenby involving British Empire forces, British, Australian, New Zealand, and others, in throwing out the Turks from, uh, from that land, the Ottoman Empire. And, and that, that campaign cost 168,000 British and Imperial casualties uh, to, to do that, to achieve it. But if it hadn't been done in 1917 and 1918, then there's no reason at all to believe that today there would be a state of Israel, because why would that land not still be uh, controlled and, and effectively owned by the Turks? It probably would be. So that's another major contribution Britain made. Unfortunately, after Britain was given the mandate, after the San Remo conference, after the League of Nations resolution, um, things began to go wrong as far as Britain's support and other European countries' support for a Jewish national homeland was concerned. 
And that went wrong for one reason, in my opinion, and one reason alone, which was the absolutely concerted opposition of the Arabs in the Middle East to any possibility of a Jewish state. Opposition which, which uh, led to, um, I believe, led to Britain betraying its, its mandate responsibilities and led to the situation we have today. Uh, and if you just take, you know, what, just one thing, I mentioned the, the, the importance of the Balfour Declaration, the importance of, um, of the Palestine campaign, military campaign, to the State of Israel today. Another thing that's also extremely important um, was the, the removal of, of uh, malaria from that territory. That territory was plagued by malaria for, for, for decades, if not centuries, before the First World War. And it was only when um, the, the, the increase came about in Jewish settlements in the area that a chap called Israel Klieger developed a program for clearing the land of malaria and making it habitable. It, wouldn't have, it couldn't really have existed as, as today without that. And even that, even that program, which was to the benefit of both the Jewish and the Arab and any other inhabitants of that land, the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem rallied his people to attack and prevent Arab cooperation with that incredibly important humanitarian project. It didn't succeed, he, he didn't succeed in doing so. But unfortunately today we see, you know, we've, uh, I think a lot of the problem we've got with, with the Arab rejection of, of the land of Israel has been largely due to European support of their rejection, starting with Britain and going through to what we see today. And you just have to look, for example, at recent developments in the Middle East where, you know, in, in, in something that I think surprised many people, the UAE and Israel are embarking today on an agreement to, to normalize relationships there. Other Arab countries will follow. Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia in due course. Other Arab countries will follow that lead. And we will see a normalization of relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Uh, but that is not in any way due to any assistance by Israel. That is due, I beg your pardon, by Europe. It is due to Israeli initiative, it's due to US initiative, and it's due to the fear that the Arab countries have of Iran, and they see Israel as being on their side in that struggle against Iran. So I, I, I think that this is, this is a sign also, and it's an indication also that, that decades and decades of peace processing where Americans, Europeans, other people have, have thrown themselves into this ridiculous peace process, which is all is much more about the process and it is about creating peace because it's absolutely nowhere. Only now with new initiatives, new resolutions, new uh, proposals and plans by mainly by the United States and Israel uh, have we seen, a, a, I think, what is effectively a paradigm shift which will be good for uh, peace in the Middle East. It will be good for Israel, without a doubt, and it will also be good for the Palestinian people because they're the ones, I think, who have suffered above everybody else. They're the ones who have been betrayed by their leadership. They're the ones who uh, have a no end, no good future in prospect or in sight. But this move could lead them there. Of course, their own leadership, the Palestinian leadership, were among the first to reject this rapprochement between the UAE and Israel. But this, this motion, I think, is a very positive thing. It may, it may meet some, uh, some problems along the way, but I do believe that it is going to get Israel and uh, its Arab neighbors into a much better position after all of this time. And unfortunately, Europe is merely a bystander. This Europe is not playing any constructive role whatsoever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Kemp. Um, uh, actually, we're not unhappy about Europe not playing a real role because they've been nothing but detrimental. Uh, they've been more concerned about labeling oranges and people being killed here, there, and the other. So, um, we're now going to turn to Q&A. If people could uh, put their uh, cues into the chat, we'll bring them up. I'd like to uh, raise a, a couple questions uh, first as we kind of queue up the chats. Uh, uh, Colonel Kemp actually addressed in part the first question, so I'm going to reframe the first question a bit, and then we'll start with Hugh, Andrew, and come back to see if uh, Colonel Kemp has any other additional items. I want to talk a little bit and hear about your views a little bit more 
uh, on the UAE uh, and Israel normalization issue. And, and specifically, uh, we couldn't agree more with what you said, Colonel Kemp. And while you were talking, a news flash just came across from the Times of Israel that says that uh, Sudan and Israel are going to be working towards normalization. There have been some flitters about that the last couple of days, but this was, you know, a concrete news break that just came across. I haven't read the article in full. So I'd like to hear, uh, I, I assume everyone, all the panelists are in agreement that this is a good thing, uh, uh, normalization of, of ties and, 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 you know, aggressive normalization of ties between UAE and Israel and the other players in the region. But I also would like you to tie it into what really is a topic here of sovereignty, because it's well known that as part of this, uh, there is a pause in sovereignty. Uh, and we like the word pause versus cessation or taking off the table, et cetera. Uh, we prefer sovereignty, of course, but um, the issue and how it was presented. And of course, we like using the term sovereignty. And on ZOA, we only like using the term sovereignty, not those other terms that, that, that the New York Times and others like to use. So uh, Hugh, if we could start with you and then turn to Andrew and then back to uh, Richard. And if you can comment upon the normalization, this potential breaking news on Sudan and how you relate it all to the sovereignty issue and what all of us still care about, which is Israel's right to the land that is really theirs. You please unmute. Yeah, I've done it. Well, first of all, I think that what's happened in, in the last few days in regard to um, normalization of relations between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, it is the beginning, I believe, of a game changer. And um, it looks as though other Arab nations will follow suit. Um, it's very interesting that um, and in, in some ways tragic that the Palestinians have uh, condemned this outright. And I think we need to realize that the reason that they've condemned it outright is quite simply that they do not believe that Israel has a right to exist. And they feel that normalization of, of, of uh, relations between Israel and other Arab countries uh, is actually compromising their desire for Israel to disappear altogether. And I think we need to recognize that. Now, I do believe that this normalization of relations uh, is, is actually really going to call the Palestinians out on this. And I think this is one of the things that we want to get across in whose land that the Palestinian leadership has never been serious about peace. Um, they, they rejected the first two-state solution proposal back in 1937 with the Peel Commission, and they've done so consistently ever since. And, and this is one of the things that the nations are not prepared to acknowledge, is the fact that the Palestinian agenda, the, and it doesn't matter whether it's the PLO, PA, which is one and the same thing, or whether it's Hamas, their agenda is for the, for the Jewish state to, to disappear. And this is why they are against a normalization of relations with other Arab countries. And I just want to say, in some ways, I think it's a little bit of a pity that and 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 uh, Morton Klein made this uh, and you made this remark in a bulletin you put out the other day. I think it's a pity in some ways, although it's it is a bit of a sweetener that Israel has temporarily um, put on hold uh, the extension of sovereignty, because actually, not only would it be a good move for Israel, but it would be a good move for. Um, the Arab Palestinians living in Area C uh, as well. I, I think it's a pity that's happened, but um, we, we, we're not here to tell the Israeli government what to do. Okay, thank you. Andrew, Un unmute please, Andrew. Thank you. 
Look, I, I, I also agree. I think uh, for any solution to be reached uh, in the region, there's going to have to be a broader uh, consensus. Um, so, so this normalization move, I think, is a paradigm change. Uh, however, um, the other side of the, the story is that the, in the international institutions, things have gone so far, and I'm thinking of the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council, and now also the International Criminal Court, that the world has virtually given the Palestinians statehood. Um, and this is, of course, what the Palestinians are, have been pushing for uh, all the time and certainly thinks since um, at least 2011 and earlier is for, for recognition of Palestinian statehood. They've achieved it almost within the General Assembly in 2012 when they were given non-member observer state status. And they're using that to become members of international treaties, including the Treaty of Rome, which is the basis of the International Criminal Court. So in that sense, the Palestinians have got everything going for them. And the last thing they're ever going to agree to is anything less than the 100% the of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. So I see absolutely zero chance for any agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and therefore, in the long run, it, it's only going to be through unilateral action by Israel I believe that it will change the status of the territories um, and, and assert its pre-existing sovereignty uh, over the territories. My, my only concern really about the plan as it was on the table before this new development, um, and my concern with the Trump peace plan is that it envisages Palestinian statehood. And I think I was concerned that if the Israeli government applies sovereignty to a small or a limited amount of the West Bank, that it does, it should never uh, implicitly or explicitly commit itself to accepting Palestinian statehood. And I'm concerned when Jared Kushner has now been making statements this week that in his view, Netanyahu agreed to a Palestinian state. Um, I'm not sure that's the case, but that's certainly his, his perception. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I think sovereign, the sovereignty issue is going to have to come back on the table. Israel is going to have to take some action. Maybe it's a good thing in the meantime that there is a, a kind of a normalization process going on, especially with the Sunni states. Um, which would be a tremendous platform for Israel at a later point with a greater international backing to start asserting its rights with respect to Judea and Samaria. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Kemp. Yeah, well, I agree with, uh, with Andrew's pessimism about the potential for a... Um, any kind of an agreement between Israel and the, and the Palestinian authority, the Palestinian Arabs, I think that's that's highly unlikely to happen. I, I'm not so concerned as he is about the elements of the Trump peace proposals that um, that included uh, a potential Palestinian state, because I do not believe for one moment that the Palestinians will ever accede to all the conditions that were laid down in Trump's proposals. Uh, to enable them to have that that state, I just don't think it's it's ever likely to happen, or certainly not in the in the foreseeable future. It's, you can't say never. Uh, like Hugh, I also think that uh, it's also disappointing. I think to an extent that the sovereignty application in areas of Judea and Samaria have been put put on pause. Like Hugh, I wouldn't wish to tell the Israeli government what they should and shouldn't do, but I think that is something that that really does need to happen and happen as soon as possible. Of course, I mean, those of you over there in the US will know better than I do that um, <clears throat> the, the outcome of the election in November will probably determine the, the future, to a large extent anyway, the future for that sovereignty issue. 
um, whether it's whether it's likely to have you know, new impetus in the new year or not. Um, I, I have been recently, about a year ago actually, in Saudi Arabia, and and when I was there, I spoke to a number of government officials who themselves are speaking pretty much about what is happening now, about the idea of uh, normalization of relations between Arab countries and, and Israel. And they didn't say they were about to do so. Um, but I certainly sense that Saudi Arabia would uh, be one of those countries that would in due course, uh, depending on political developments and events within Saudi and depending on you know, other, other issues, would, would in due course uh, join this, this, uh, this normalization. Certainly, Sudan, I think, as you know, the breaking news tells us, is liable to do so. Morocco, perhaps, as well, and the other countries I mentioned earlier. So I think, you know, I think it, I think it is very positive. And, and one of the positives about it is that it, 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 it won't change the Palestinians' mind, but it will certainly undermine their position, and it will undermine. It, it will make it very much more difficult for. And I agree that it doesn't really matter a damn too much what the Europeans have got to say about all this. But it will certainly undermine European uh, effective opposition to Israel, which is which is just growing stronger and stronger. Thank you. Dominoes can really be great, so we hope there are more dominoes to uh, to, to follow. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to ask you about Christ each of you about Christian Zionism. Uh, you're all Christian, and frankly, in the U.S., uh, we need that Christian Zionism because. Uh, uh, so many, unfortunately, so many of our, our, our Jewish brethren and sistren uh, don't have nearly the feeling for Israel that certainly we at ZOA do, and certainly that many Americans and, and many Christians do. And so we're delighted to have folks with your views, you know, be out there. If you could comment, each of you, on Christian Zionism, and however you want to frame it or address it, uh, we're delighted to have it, but better you speak about it than me. Uh, we'll start again with Hugh and then go to Andrew and then back to uh, Colonel Kim. Well, um, the Zionist heart has been with the Jewish people throughout the 2000 years of the diaspora. And um, They've been saying every year at Pesach and, and every day in some prayers um, next year in Jerusalem. And so uh, Jerusalem and Israel has always been in the Jewish heart. Now, as a Christian, what, uh, what came to me as a young Christian, I was in my early 20s at the time, and, and quite, a, quite a new Christian in terms of my commitment was uh, I, I saw a film made by the Billy Graham organization called His Land, that means God's Land. And uh, in that, Cliff Richard, who was a well known singer in Britain and I think in the USA as well, and um, Cliff Barrows, who's part of the Billy Graham organization, they did a sort of musical journey through Israel. This is only a couple of years after the Six Day War, and that captured my uh, imagination. I saw pro Bible prophecy being fulfilled before my very own eyes. Now, Christian Zionism really goes back. Um, I'm, I'm not so keen on the term myself, but it goes back uh, several centuries. It goes back to after the Reformation um, and with the Puritans and then the Evangelicals. And a key, a key issue was the translation of the Bible into our own language. Now, the church institution, really from about the third century um, of the common era onwards, believed that God had rejected the, the, the Jewish people and um, and so Israel was something of the past. But the translation of the Bible into our own language enlightened Christians to the fact that God still had a purpose for the nation of Israel, and that one day Israel would be restored to her land. And the interesting thing is, and I made a film called The Cyrus Call on this, uh, Cyrus being 
the the, the person who um, brought the Jewish people back after the Babylonian exile. Um, if you look at Christian leaders in Britain and in America throughout the um, the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, and even slightly before that, every single one of them had uh, a vision for the restoration of Israel from the prophetic scriptures. And, and so this is what has driven what is today known as Christian Zionism. And you have in America a huge organization, Kufi, and there are many others as well, um, who support Israel. And it's, we believe it's our biblical duty to do so because without the Jewish people, there would be no Christianity today. And I believe that the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage that we have here in Britain and you have in America is being seriously undermined in these, in these days. And we need to stand up for that. Thank you. Andrew. Yes, uh, I fully 100% echo what, what Hugh has said. I think it's the great tragedy of the church has been uh, this complete blindness to, um, to Israel. And, the, you know, I, I know for myself, I grew up in an Anglican uh, background and implicitly, it was never really an explicit teaching, but implicitly the idea was, you know, you have the New Testament and the Old Testament and the New Testament is the real thing and the Old Testament that was from the old times. And as, as Hugh says, we, we, cut off, uh, we cut off the Jewish people out of God's great, enormously gracious plan for redemption of this, this whole world. Um, and, and when you start to understand that as a Christian, you understand the, the enormity of... Uh, what God is doing by creating the Jewish people and, and always being faithful to the Jewish people as his instrument for, uh, for redemption of the world. So th there's a huge history that we have to um, deal with. And now it's, I mean, even the fact that we have what are called Christian Zionists is, is, is crazy in a sense that, I mean, every Christian should be a Zionist. Mm, yeah. um, it should be part of our DNA to be looking and praying for the restoration of Israel and the coming of the Messiah of Israel uh, to be king over the nations. So I, we have a lot of work to do in the church. There's an enormous amount of ignorance, and I think education is the key, both biblical, historical, um, and then from my perspective, making the connection politically and legally. Um, at the end of the day, all of this is very political. And we Christians often don't like to get involved in politics. We get a bit nervous about when things get too political. But the reality is what God's doing in bringing the Jewish people home from the four corners of the earth has an enormous political impact. And I think we have a choice to make as church, as Christians, but also as nations, whether we support this great endeavor or not. And this, this, is, the, this is the message we have to, to governments as well. Uh, and that's why I think the governments that we are seeing supporting Israel tend to be Christian governments. Uh, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm thankful for my Australian prime minister, for example, who he, I wouldn't say his knowledge is fantastic, but he has a heart commitment to the Jewish people, I think, in the state of Israel, um, surrounded by many very good Christian and Jewish politicians. And we need to grow that coalition of nations uh, to, to be a stronger voice. And, and, you know, from my perspective, law is just a tool in, in this whole process, um, which is being misused to... I think, uh, draw people away. But I think law, international law, supports Zionism, supports the Jewish people. Uh, and while it's a minority voice, I think it's a, a powerful voice. And it can move the hearts and minds 
of those people whom God raises to positions of authority and leadership. And I think we can trust in that. Thank you. And for the last word on this topic, Richard. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also a Christian, uh, but I think by comparison to, uh, to Hugh and Andrew, I'm probably more like a heathen. Um, so although I'm a Christian and I am a Zionist, I don't consider myself to be a Christian Zionist. So my, my support for Zionism and for the state of Israel is not really religiously motivated. I don't, my, my religious beliefs don't have any problem with it, of course, and I'm sure they support it, but it's not my motivation. My motivation is more um, military and political based on my own military experience more than anything else. Um, and, you know, I recognize that uh, Israel, the UK, the US, Australia, other countries, other Western Christian countries um, share, uh, share values, we share principles, we share our laws, we share so much in, in, in common and it's in, extremely important that we support each other and back each other up uh, in that fight. And all I need to do is just look around the Middle East today and I see the only country where Christians are protected from the kind of murder and depredation and de deprivation of rights that they receive everywhere else is Israel. Israel is the only country where you can be Christian and you, you don't need to have any fears or concerns and indeed the Christian population is growing. And that, that obviously in itself is important. Finally, I would say that um, there was an event that occurred today that reminds us of the importance of the state of Israel, how in, not just for Jews, of course for Jews above all else, but for all of us. And that was the overflight of Dachau concentration camp today by airplanes from the Israeli Air Force, first time ever they've flown over Germany, um, and the German Air Force flying alongside them. An incredible signal, which I think uh, goes to show the importance of having a strong and military powerful Jewish state, because had that Jewish state existed with power back in the days when Dachau and Auschwitz and Belsen were in full swing, those horrific uh, projects would not have taken place. The, 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 the modern day Israel, the predecessors of the modern day Israel would have certainly intervened and stopped that from happening. And that's why I think as a, as a Christian, as a, I, I would just say just as a relatively decent human being, it's so important that we support and do everything we can to back Israel and, and uh, hopefully do what we can to help it flourish and go from strength to strength. Well, thank you. That is a tremendous note on which to uh, finish our, our, our program. Uh, Christian Zionism is very important, but also to know that there is a, a, a pure, you know, military and political understanding of, of why this is important. And, and really the strength of the IDF and the strength of the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, has been so critical to some of the achievements. What the UAE announcement would have never happened if, if there weren't a strong Israel. So um, we hope there'll be more announcements going forward. We hope that when we get together next time, maybe there's some more movement on the sovereignty issue by the Israeli government. Um, and as we said last time, I think last time I, I saw you or we spoke, Richard, as well as our other guests here, we're hoping that the pandemic will go away in near future and that we'll be able to host you in our ZOA headquarter offices in, in New York City. They're beautiful offices and we'd be delighted to have you there in person um, when we have this uh, pandemic issue resolved, which hopefully will happen in the near future. Um, in the chat room, we have, a whole, uh, we have a number of programs that are coming up in the very near future. ZOA has been doing an incredible job throughout this pandemic, two, three, four programs a week. So if you look in the chat, you'll see a number of the programs that are there. Uh, we're sorry we couldn't get to you know, all the questions. We did try to address a number of the issues, and, and I believe the hosts, the, I'm sorry, the guests did a great job in addressing many of those. I do want to mention a surprise program which doesn't show up in the programming. Uh, we have arranged for a, a three o'clock um, conference call tomorrow uh, for our donor society members with uh, uh, Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador to Washington. We just set this up very recently, uh, obviously in light of the UAE announcement with Israel. So we'll be privileged to have um, Ambassador Ron Dermer with us tomorrow at three o'clock. 
The invitation has not gone out yet because we're just even finalizing this as this call is going on. But donor society members should look for that invitation in the mail. Again, my profound and, 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 and thanks from, from the organization, Zionist Organization of America, or Z Organization of America, which Richard has said numerous times whenever we've chatted, uh, and, and Hugh and Andrew and Richard, thank you so much on behalf of ZOA. And for all our uh, watchers out there uh, on Webinar land, uh, we kept the audience through most of the program. We do try to get done as close to the hour as we can. So I want to thank also Alan Jay, Jackie Schaefer, my ZOA colleagues, Mort Klein, and, and a whole bunch of us. And we hope everyone has a good day. In, in the UK, it's already night. I don't know what it is in Australia. But again, on behalf of the, of the Z Organization of America, I want to thank you all very much. You're good friends. And we look to have you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.